<laughs> well, I already lost my brain, so if I lose my phone, who cares, right? <laughs> I just get to start over. You know, Thomas Edison, when his um, he had a workshop where all his inventions were, and he had no um, no um, fire insurance on the building, and one night it burns to the ground, and they lose everything, and his wife is just sobbing, and he turns to her and says, "Honey, we've lo- we've all our mistakes are burned up. Like <laughs> now we can start over." So he to him the glass was just always half full. Awesome. Yeah, yeah um, I love reading stories like that because everybody falls down and things that we least expect are going to happen. And if we can see it as a blessing, it actually manifests as a blessing. But if we see it as a curse or as a detriment, then it manifests as a detriment. You know, so true. Yeah, I'm learning. I'm learning. I love I love Mark eleven twenty four. I just love that that scripture because it changes um, the way that we can look at things. And to look at something is to calculate it. It means to count. You know, you heard me talk about count it all joy. Mm-hmm. And I used to fake it all joy. I, I, <laughs> I didn't know what it meant to count it joy. I followed Kenneth Copeland for years. I have followed him for years. And he is big on Mark eleven twenty four, 24. And, um, but I never thought of it the same way that you have taught me to think of it. Especially the idea of when the idea of pray and count and count, you know, the calculate. And when I pray, I'm not asking for something. That's right. You know, that is big. Isn't that huge? It's like it changes everything. Because if you ask for it, that means you believe you don't have it. Exactly. And if you believe you have it, you wouldn't ask for it. They'd be like, exactly. if I had this pen in my hand, I'd say, oh, hey, honey, hand me this pen. He'd be like, Angela, you have it. I asked. So until I began to study letters and words and numbers, I didn't know that there were so many meanings. And imagine that. We have the English language. We probably have the most confusing language ever because there's yeah. like two, two, and two. Exactly. Right? And then we have, a, we have something called a two-two. Mm-hmm. Right. So imagine people speaking another language and we say she was wearing a tutu. What do they think? You know, like that. She was wearing the number two twice. What? I mean, we we don't realize how um, how homonyms might sound to other people. Well, we don't know one thing when I started studying French, especially if if we say in English, I am hungry. In French, it's I have hunger. And when you think about it, it's so different. Yeah. It's yeah. so different. That's right. And so as we begin to look at scripture in light of the fullness of a word, mm-hmm. the fullness of a word, not a part understanding of a word, you could take one part of my body and clip it off like my fingernail and clip it off, and set it down and say, who is this? People are like, I don't know, it's just a fingernail. Like, what is that? But you could give it to a scientist. Mm -hmm. You could take my DNA or my mitochondria from one strand of hair and go, oh, that's Angela Burton, 99.99999% sure. Yeah. Right? Because he looks at the constituents of all the markers that are in it and not just one part of it. Now, if you look at me and you know me, Mm -hmm. Facebook does face recognition now. And there's a couple of women that are on Facebook that it will often ask me to tag myself in. And it's not me. It's not me. It's somebody else. Hey, Cheryl Mesa. Welcome, welcome. So, yeah, it's like crazy that Facebook recognizes other people as me and says, Angela, do you want to tag yourself in this post? I'm like, no, that's not me. It's like, but it looked, I mean, I can see why Facebook would think it's me. Mm-hmm. You know, we have the same nose, the same forehead, the same cheekbones, the same, the same basic structure of the face. But you can tell we're not the same people. If you put us side by side, it's quite obvious, right? And so words in scripture, because we have recently um, 
or at least for me, I, I've, I've recently be, began to study other languages, specifically the Hebrew. But in looking at Hebrew, I, I have to, in the New Testament, I have to look at Greek, and then I have to take that Greek and then try to find what the Hebrew equivalent is. And then some people say, oh, well, that's not what that word means because that was in the Greek. I'm like, where do you think Greek came from? <laughs> now, it's Greek it originally came from something called Canaanite Sanskrit. So in that translation, something was lost. Like if I cut my fingernail off and I lay it on the table and say, who's this belong to? Unless you have my DNA, you won't know that because some of the translation is lost. But the full, but the, the full DNA is still in one cell of my body. And you could clone me if you, you know, have the right lab and have the right knowledge. You could actually clone me from one cell, right? That's, we know people can do that now. But the word of God, we haven't thought about the word as a person, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we actually don't think about us being one with God and one in each other and that we're all one body, just different members of the same body. Imagine if I treated you like I treat myself. Now that could be good or it could be painful. Depends on how you treat yourself. Mm-hmm. Depends on how you treat myself. Now, the truth of the matter is, I really do treat you like I treat myself. I really do love you like I love myself. The question is, how do I love myself? I'll give you a specific example of how real this is. And I've shared it a few times. Um, but one of my dearest friends is Kim Kern. And I asked Kim one day, I said, Kim, I want you to be real honest with me. From the time you met me to now, Am I the same person? And if not, why? And, you know, tell me how I made you feel when you first met me. And she said, I felt intimidated by you. And I was like, but Kim, I just, I've always loved you. And I, I, I would never want to intimidate you. Why were you intimidated? She really couldn't put her finger on it. But my sisters have told me the same thing, that I was pride or arrogant. And I was like, but I'm doing everything so you'll love me. Mm. I couldn't figure out how that felt like pride or arrogance. Really what it was, was a low self-esteem. And so what I did was I was constantly measuring myself. So if I measure myself by a certain standard, what standard, whether you, whether I wanted to admit, admit it or not, I was measuring myself by the world standard and by the church's standard. It was like a mixture you know, of the two, because the church don't really supposedly have a standard of what you look like. We're supposed to accept everybody, right? But we really do care about what we look like, right? Like back in the day, like I didn't want to go anywhere without makeup, but I am now, right? But back in the day, I was like, I can't go anywhere without having makeup on, you know, or, or if I had to put my hair in a ponytail because my hair was greasy, I didn't want to go anywhere. You know, like sometimes I just let my hair go greasy, right? Like a couple of days I wash my hair and then third day I wash my hair, Right. But I, if I was judging myself that way, guess how I was judging you even though I didn't know it? The same way. See, I can't judge you one way and me another way and it be truthful, but I thought I did. I, I, I had deceived myself and think, oh, well, I, I really love you, but I don't really, I just don't like me. That's bull. If I don't like me, and there's this particular, let's just say I didn't like gray hair and mine's gray and yours is gray. And I said, oh, but I love yours. That wouldn't make sense, would it? Mm-mm. Let's say I hated skinny legs because I did it one time. I hated my skinny legs. People made so much fun of me that I literally hated skinny legs. So what if I came up to you and I said, oh, I love your skinny legs, but I just hate mine. No. See, you would know I'm lying. So whatever judgment I placed on myself, which was a lot, without me saying it, without me consciously aware of it, I was placing all of my judgments on my friend Kim and everybody else, my family, but I was the one who wasn't aware of it because I didn't feel prideful. I felt insignificant or inadequate. And because I felt inadequate, I was trying to be adequate and I made others feel inadequate. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So now I really do love myself. 
in all of my quirkiness and all of the weird things I say and weird things I do and silly whatever and awesome whatever, I love my silliness as much as I love my awesomeness because I think being silly is awesome. But back in the day, I'd have just been embarrassed. Like sometimes I accidentally say words wrong because I've, I've, I see a word phonetically. So one day I had gotten a new iPad. You know what an iPad is, right? Like you're kind of like a phone, but... But I had gotten a new iPad, and it, was, it came free with my iPhone. And so I had picked, me and Michael were traveling. I picked up my iPad, and I said, Michael, I found my iPad, but have you seen my iPhone anywhere? And he said, you're what? I said, my iPhone, I can't find it. He's like, Angela, you're what? I said, Michael, my iPhone, can't you hear me? He's like, baby, you mean your iPhone? I was like, oh, yeah, you know what I meant. You know, but it was, we just laughed so hard because – you know, here I study all these words and the diencephalon and the heart brain and quantum physics, and I sound smart sometimes, right? You know, because I study a lot. But then I turn right around and I call this an iPhone. Like, what was I thinking? I wasn't. It was just phonetic. It's like I always thought he should not say pho. He should say pu. Like, it shouldn't be pneumonia. But it says pneumonia starts with a P, right? Like, why? Who did that? Of course, now I understand a P and an F are very related. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that at the time because I'd see phonetically. So, of course, I'm, I make up words. Like, one time, Michael and I were, um, he was picking on me about something, and, and, and I, I was trying to think of the word. This is not going to sound right, but I'm going to say it anyway. Who cares? It's so funny. If he walked in the door, he'd be like, don't tell anybody you said that. But I was trying to, I was trying to decide, I'm not going to say dictation or, um, just a minute, <laughs> translation. And I mixed the two words together. And I'm just going to let you figure out what I said. <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. Dictation and translation. And I mixed the two words together and I was in front of people. And Michael said, what'd you say? I was like, I said it again. He said, what do you say? I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Because it didn't come out very nice. It came out like, what the heck were you trying to say? I was like, I was trying to say dictation or translation. And I got the words mixed up and it came out like not like a very nice word. Is that funny? That is so hilarious. We still laugh about that. And my daughter was in the room. My husband was in the room. And I'm in the room. And I'm going, thank God. It wasn't a room full of people or it wasn't on one of my television shows, right? Like when I used to, I did my television show 13 episodes and thank God for edit. You can hit pause <laughs> and edit something out. Well, in real life, you can't edit. Like it just comes out. There it is. And so I'm a, you know, public speaker, an international speaker. I get up sometimes in front of 200 something people. Michael says, Angela, watch your words. I'm like, I know, Michael, but if I say something, guess what? I'm just going to say it. And we're all going to laugh, and it's going to be funny, and I can be humble and vulnerable, and I can say goofy stuff, and it's okay. I really still like me. So people mm -hmm. like that because they feel like they can say something stupid or silly or mixed up, and you still like them, right? Because you're going to judge others the way you judge yourself, right? So one of the things you'll hear me say to you or to others, um, I am you, you are me. What I'm really saying is we're all one body. We're all the same. I'm no different. We're just alike. I bleed the same color you bleed. I, 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 my poop stinks every morning. My breath stinks every morning. Sometimes in the middle of the day, and I got to go brush you know, two or three times a day. It's what we should do anyway. But back in the day when I was living a life of trying to measure up so that God would like me, so that you would like me, so that somebody would like me, that comes from a belief that I'm not likable. So it made other people feel not likable because whether I walked around with a tape measure or not, I walked around with a tape measure and that made people feel intimidated. And so now my friend Kim will tell me if, if I'm making her feel intimidated, she'd just come right out and tell me. But she said, Angela, I feel loved with you. And it just, that made my heart so happy that I was able to see what I was doing to people, but I didn't realize I was doing that to me. 
I was doing that to myself. I'm made in the image of God. The man that preached this morning at our church, his name is John Tussie, and he had the beautiful message. He was talking about us being made in the image of God. And when you see that you're made in the image of God and you think God is wonderful, guess what you'll think about yourself? People will remember the answer. That's arrogance. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's a difference between being grateful that you have a God that loves you in spite of yourself and that you can love. God actually said, I want you to love yourself as you are. I said, God, I don't, I don't, how am I supposed to love myself as I am? My, my brain's wicked. I like revenge. You know, I, 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 there have been times I've been full of hatred and unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness. I said, God, I don't like that part of me. He said, until you can love all of you, you can't love all of somebody else. And they're going to feel it. And I said, well, God, what good is, I mean, why did you make me this way? Why did you make me where there are times when I feel loving and times when I don't? Sometimes my body wants, you know, equality rather than mercy. Like, I want mercy for me, but, it, but justice when it's somebody else. Like, that's the nature. You know, eye for an eye, tooth for new tooth, that kind of thing. And the Lord said, you know, to me that until, until I could see myself loved in a wretched condition, I couldn't love others in their wretched condition. And so God began to reveal to me all the things about myself that I didn't want to see, all the things about myself I didn't like, all the things about myself that I was trying to change. And scripture says an Ethiopian can't change his skin or a leper can't change his spots, neither an Ethiopian his skin. Why you who are evil do you try and be good? But yet another scripture says be ye holy, or be perfect, even as your heavenly father is perfect. But perfection and good are two different things. Perfection means mature, ripe, like a piece of fruit in the summer. Like imagine walking up to a peach tree. You, you may hear me say this before, but I love peaches. But imagine walking up to a peach tree in the heat of the summer. You got sweat on your brow, you know, you're wearing your tennis shoes, and maybe some knicker pants and a t-shirt. And you reach up and you grab... The, bit, the prettiest peach you could find, and it's kissed by the sun, it's still warm, and you don't even wash it because it's organic, you know. And you just put it to your mouth, and you take a bite, and it just, just runs down you because it's just so juicy and sweet and tart and rough and smooth all at the same time, all those beautiful textures together. Now, if you just had just the outside of the peach, and that's all you have, that tastes nasty on your tongue, doesn't it? Like it's fuzzy, feels like almost like sandpaper, but the rest of the peach is so good. You know what? I will endure that part that I don't like just to, have, and I won't even peel it because there's a, on the inside of the peach, the other side of it. I like that way that it tastes once I chew it all up. So life is kind of like that in the heat of the moment when you're sweating and you're, everything seems like you just can't make it and you're thirsty and you take a bite of life and the part of that life you don't really like because it feels too rough. But all the rest that's on the inside makes it worth that those hard parts we have to go through, right? Jesus said, no man takes my life, I lay it down. And we laid down our lives when we came here to earth. We were called, we were chosen. He's the first, we're one of the many. The earth is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It says the earth is groaning. And Christ manifested as the Son of God. We're supposed to be following him, right? I just think this is just, God is just so amazing to wake us up and show us that in our wretchedness, he loves us so much that we are made in his image and he delights in us. When I saw that, I can delight in other people. Like, I don't need them to be perfect for me to delight in them. I believe we're perfectly imperfect. We're perfectly imperfect, and we have our own little quirky whatever about us. And we attract each other to each other, and we repel each other from each other. And I used to get mad if I was repelled from someone. Like, they didn't want to hang out with me or whatever. Boy, I'd be so offended. Now I'm like, you know what? My toe wouldn't look real good sticking out my face. Right? Like, my toe belongs down there on my foot. That's a good spot for it. And it has great relationship with the arch of my foot and my heel. And it's in close proximity to my calf. But my shoulder's not. But yet we're still one body. So when somebody doesn't mesh well with me, I'm like, you know what? That's okay. Sometimes I put my foot up like this and it's a little bit closer to the rest of me. 
but I still don't want my foot sticking out my face. Sometimes I put my foot in my mouth and need to pull it out, right? <laughs> but it's okay that everybody's not the best of friends, but we can still love each other the same. We can still have love and compassion and understanding and caring and genuine um, just love for that person because they're our brother or sister because they're God's child. You know, I don't know y'all's children, right? But if I love you and I say I don't like your children, already your eyebrows are raising up on the inside if they're not even on the outside. If I said something bad about your child while I'm stroking your ego and telling you how much I love you, you wouldn't know I'm lying to you. I cannot say I love you and not love your kids. Am I telling the truth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. Because if you, if you know that my child is my heart, you know that hurting my child, you hurt me worse. Because to watch a child suffer is suffering. That's the worst. Slapping me or me watching you slap my grandchild. Mm-hmm. I'd rather you slap me. Because you slap my grandchild, I'm going to want to kill you. Right? Like, th- there's something inside of us as a parent that loves our child beyond any comprehension of the brain. And God loves all of us that way. All of us that way. He loves, he, he, he said, anybody can love those who love them. Perfection is loving those who don't love you. Right? Well, there was a time when I didn't love me. I was my own worst enemy. Might not look like it, but I was. And it wasn't until God showed me how much he loved me that I started being okay with myself. I started going, well, okay, I guess I'll, I guess I'll you know, kind of peek in and see who I really am and see if I can tolerate myself. Because part of me was a victim mentality. Part of me was pride. Part of me was you know, jealousy and revenge and all those human attributes that I didn't want to have. But yet God made me human. He made me fearfully and wonderfully with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I had all, all that. And I was like, God, why'd you do this? Why'd you make me this way? But you know what pride will do? Pride will cause you to judge someone. Your judgment will then re- be required of you and you'll become what you judge. And the very thing that was against you at first, God will now use for your good to make you humble. And you will be humbled at your own judgment when it comes back on you. That happened to Pharaoh. He talked about, you know, tonight your, your firstborn will die. Moses said, out of your own mouth shall your judgment come upon you. And Matthew 7 and 1 says, judge not, least you be judged, for with the same measure of judgment you judge, it will be judged back unto you. And I've learned now that judgment's not terrible. If you've read my book, No Longer Deceived, there's a quote in there, and it says this. It says, judgment is the fabric used by the Holy Spirit to fashion my garments of humility that deliver me from the pride of life. So the pride that was against me, that caused me to judge, that judgment came upon me, crushed my pride, and caused me to be humbled. And and now I love the one I used to not love because I became the one I didn't love. I became the one I judged. It's like he who knew no sin became all sin, right? When you, when you came in this world, you were innocent. But you became a judge when you became aware of the law. This is good, and that's bad. This is right, and that's wrong. And then you trusted in it. How do I know? So did I. Right? We trusted in that. But the law has to come first, but then it must die. And once the law dies, the promise can live. And once the promise lives, that's like... The, the sunflower that dies, so the, uh, the sunflower seed that dies, so the sunflower can live. You see, that which is temporary can go away, and that which is eternal can come. And that's really what being in this body is all about. Is so the word of God can come into us and die, take root, crush us, rip open our chest, circumcise our heart, cause us to uh, be humbled and then united with Christ in suffering, united with each other in suffering. And in that union, we begin to love all people at all times, including ourselves simultaneously. And so I can't love myself and not love you. I would be a liar. I can't judge myself and not judge you. I would be a liar. If 
I'm judging you, whether I know it or not, I'm judging myself. And, it, and it's like there's so many mysteries that are being revealed in the word of God and judgment's one of them. And I used to be afraid of judgment. I used to hate judgment. I didn't want judgment. But now I understand that in the Bible, in the book of Hosea, it says God betrothed me in judgment and in tender mercies and in kindness. And it was in me becoming what I judged others to be that I saw my pride. It crushed my heart, I fell on my face, literally in fetal position on the floor, weeping and couldn't eat for weeks because I finally understood what my sister had told me and what my friend Kim had the courage to tell me as well. And I said, oh, God, deliver me. Because all along, even in my pride, I didn't know I was prideful because I felt rejected. I felt not good enough. So when you don't feel good enough, that don't feel like pride. It feels like inadequate. But thinking that you could do something that's adequate enough is pride. See, I really can't see unless I see with my father's eyes. I can't hear unless I hear with my father's ears. I can't calculate unless I calculate with Christ showing me the calculation. And missing the calculation is missing the mark. To miss the mark is sin. So to do anything on my own, to even something as simple as perceive on my own is sin. That's sin, the, to perceive without God's perception. To see or to perceive without listening. You know, in scripture it says, don't be a hearer of the word, uh, but be a doer also. Well, that word doer means a poet. Go look it up. It means one who poets what he hears. So it literally means don't be a hearer only. Hear it and then repeat what you say. When you repeat what you say, you're repeating God's word. And when you repeat what you heard God say, God's word manifests. Not because you're obedient, but because you know that your best is as filthy rags. And has God spoken it and shall it not be? So now when God tells me something, I'll say, Lord, you know I can't perform your word. You know that the minute the, the, I hear it as the law, and the minute the law um, comes in, sin's going to get power from the law, and I'm going to fail you. So, Father, take my, take my best, which is filthy rags, and, and I give you that, and you do with your word in me whatever you want. You manifest it. Make it come to pass. Have you thought it, and shall it not be? And I receive God's word as a, de as a declaration over me rather than instruction for me to go obey. That's pretty amazing, right? So now when I hear the word of the Lord, I'll say, Lord, okay, I heard that. Now you perform it. And I wait for the opportunity to come in front of me where I can watch God perform. I've spoken things before out of my mouth and I'm thinking, Lord, Angela, just shut up. Where did that come from? And some of you have heard me tell the story where I commanded it to rain when I was in Montana. And I was on an airplane in front of a bunch of people. And I'm commanding it to rain like I know what I'm doing. And in my mind, I'm going, shut up, shut up, shut up. You can't make it rain. And it did. It rained just like that. And then it happened five times within a week where I would command it to rain. And my head's going, shh, you can't make it rain. That's stupid. Don't say that. You're going to look like a fool. But my mouth is talking. And I'm going, oh, Jesus, where is that coming from? And then literally the rain would come. And we were in a, um, I was in the valley in Montana, and there was smoke everywhere, and ashes were falling on the cars, and it was predicted that the, that the valley would burn. Let me um, invite Jamie in. It was predicted that, hi, Jean, it was predicted the valley would burn, and so here I am going, this valley will not burn on my watch, and I'm prophesying rain, and there's a whole... Um, Fourier in the pavilion is full of bi uh, bikers looking at which direction they're going to drive in the, in the valley on Highway 93 to, so that they don't get ashes in their face and smoke. And I said, that's not, that's not smoke, that's rain clouds. And my brain's going, what are you thinking? Just go get your coffee and shut up. Go sit down and have your breakfast. You don't know, don't talk to these people. And the people say, you're not from here, are you? And I said, no. And I began to prophesy and talk about Jesus and I commanded it to rain and rain came all the way under the pavilion 
and rained on the people under the, pushed them in the door, and then I preached Jesus to them. And then I couldn't wait to get out the room because I was like, what the heck just happened to me? <laughs> How did that happen? Because, see, the Spirit of God was speaking through me. I wasn't obeying. God was just doing it. Let me tell you something. My brain was saying, uh, get out of here. Like, this is, you don't, you don't even, you, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? But literally what came out of my mouth happened. God performs his word, Angela, don't. I cannot perform the word of God. I tell people now, I don't even obey God. I just can't tell him that. Right? Because when you hear it, when you hear the voice of God in your heart, your, your adrenaline begins to pump. Your emotions begin to change. Your body begins to tremble. I can feel it come over my body, and it's like, oh, something's fixing to happen. Don't know what it is. And at one time, I was really concerned I'd look stupid. And I have looked some pretty ridiculous situations before, but I would see people heal and people heal and people heal. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just look stupid then because people are getting healed. I'm cool with that. And my brain says, well, I ain't, I don't like looking stupid. But my heart says, I don't care. They love me. They just may not know it yet. <laughs> it took me a long time to know how, how lovable I am. That really is part of our big deal is we don't know how awesome we are. If you knew you were made in the image of God, would you really criticize yourself? Mm. No, you would say you look just like Jesus. I challenge you to look in the mirror and say you look like Jesus. You may not know it yet, but you look like Jesus. Je Jesus, make me look like you. Manifest yourself through me. Ask him to do what you're not able to do and quit trying. Our efforts are as, our best is as filthy rags. But God can do through us if we just acknowledge, Lord, I can't do it now. And he goes, yeah, now, now we talking. Now I can do. And he says, what's the desire of your heart? Where your heart is, there shall your treasure be also. Just stay with the desire of your heart. Well, the desire of my heart is that people would see the love of God through me. The desire of my heart is that not one would perish. The desire of my heart is that all would be healed and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the desire of my heart. So when you stay there, your actions follow that, not because you're choosing to, but because your heart impels you. Has anybody ever, ever seen a, a, or heard a baby um, deer cry in the woods and watch a mama deer respond. You've ever seen that? It's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. I was in Montana and we were um, going up Pole Bridge Road, which is a road that's in, next to, uh, on the way to Glacier National Park to one of the most remote parts of Glacier. It'll take you all the way up to the Canadian border. And we stopped at the place along the way. It was like a big ravine. And Michael said, I bet you there's some deer down in there. Well, you know, Michael's a big hunter and he loves to see deer. They're muley deers. And so we, um, we stopped and pulled off, and he said, he's like, cry like a baby, that, do that crying thing you do. So I did. I, went, I covered my mouth like that, and I made a little sound, like that. And when I did that, all the female mama deer stood up and just started looking as if it was their baby they heard cry. They didn't say, hmm, what if I was that my baby, and if I should stand up? Let me think about that. No, what, they didn't obey. They were impelled. The sound forced them to their feet, even though their infant may have been right next to them. Could have been even nursing, right? And, and they just came to attention. And they were, they were deer all in that valley. But when they were bedded down, you, of course, if they're bedded down, the baby deer's not nursing, but, but they were bedded down and you really couldn't see them. But once I made that little sound, boy, they all stood up. And then I was uh, on a vacation with my family one time, and there was a bunch of muleys behind the restaurant that we were at. And my sister was like, man, we just missed it. I said, that's okay. I'll call them back. She said, you can't call them back. I said, oh, yes, I can. Watch. So I made a little sound like the baby um, deer. And sure enough, all those mama deer came right back around. I'm like, wait, wait, wait we, we're missing a baby. But if I said, hey, y'all, come over here and obey me. Come do what I want you to do. They wouldn't have came. I impelled them. I used their instinct. And when your heart... Is, is crushed with Jesus' heart. 
when you weep with him, when you suffer with him, when you're united with him, his voice will impel you. It's not a decision that you make. It's a, I can't tell him no. That's really what God's desire is, is that you and his heart just become one. It's the same thing if you saw a child on the side of the road and that child was hungry. And here you are with, you know, a, a full meal. You'd want to feed that baby. Even if you'd never laid eyes on that baby before, something inside of you would impel you to do that. And, you know, we know that the, the, the human race has more than once became so calloused that not only would they not have compassion one for another, but cannibalism had taken over. Even in our world today, our world is very, very calloused. And we, you know, we fight for the right to kill a baby after it's born in America. That's unbelievable that we, we do that, that we fight for that. And I say we because I'm part of the human race. And then one part of the human race is crying out, saying, no. Another part of the human race is saying, yeah, it's my right. You know, I could have, my arm could be paralyzed and not feel anything. And this arm could feel everything. And this arm could say, no, fire don't hurt. That's, that's good. And this arm would say, no, fire's going to kill you. Get out of there. But when something's dead, it can't feel right? When my hand goes to sleep, it's up to the rest of the body to wake it up, right? You ever, you ever fall asleep and you get your legs are asleep and you like, if you go to try to stand up, you're going to fall? It happened to me once where yeah. my, both my legs were completely dead. I was like, oh, I'm paralyzed. Like, my legs on your legs. I said, my legs never been asleep like this. I had to pick them up and move. I started beating on my legs to get the circulation back in my legs, it felt like they were paralyzed. So I needed the rest of my body to stimulate the blood flow for whatever reason, I was sleeping in a way that both of my legs went dead. When the world appears as dead, we have to reach their heart. Love is what's gonna change people. Love is what's gonna pierce their hearts. Love when they're not lovable. Rather than arguing a point, Find a place where they've suffered and reach them with love. Reach them, just keep reaching with love. Keep reaching with love. Because let me tell you something, destruction's already upon us. It really is. And when I didn't know how to love me, and I didn't see God in me, I couldn't love other people. And God comes in, in many different ways of showing us the truth, that came to me was very, very painful. That was seeing God in me. To see the truth in me was to see God in me. And the truth that was I was uh, self-loathing. I was um, low self-esteem. I was prideful. I was arrogant. And I was trusting in my own ability to obey God so he would love me. As if God would take a trade. And when that truth came into my perception, it broke my heart, it crushed my heart, and it was the beginning process of me awakening. And so people will often criticize themselves to me. Well, Angela, yeah, but I'm not like you, or, or well, I don't see like you, or, or you don't, I have this wrong with me. And I'll say, you don't need to fix all that, you just need to wake up to how amazing you are. If you could wake up to how amazing you are, that stuff wouldn't come out of your mouth. You know? My grandson is barely one, and he can make a really bad poopy diaper, right? But that does not define him. He falls down and gets bumps and bruises. That doesn't define him. But somehow if we fall down or we make a mess, we think it defines us. God doesn't think it defines you. God looks at you. And he says, there's not another set of eyes that can look at me the way you do. There's not another voice that sounds like yours to my ears. Your, or, your voice is like honey. Your, your touch, there's not another set of fingerprints like yours in the world, Angela. And when you hold my hand and you talk to me, nobody touches me the way you do. And Jesus can say that and not lie. And he can say that to every single person in its trip. 
Imagine if we shared that with the world. Imagine if we could get them to believe it. You won't unless you believe it about yourself. If you believe it about yourself, it won't take them long. They'll believe it about themselves. You'll start believing that you're amazing. You're making God's image. I'm going to check my Facebook and see if we have any messages on there because we're going live and then we'll see how, how long we stay here tonight. You know, um, I need to put this out there. Um, the team that does the background work for my Zoom and my YouTube and all that, uh, that team is changing up. So I don't know how much longer we're going to be doing um, some of the things we're doing on WOW H2O. We may just change it up some, but um, it may just be more spontaneous as opposed to scheduled, you know. Um, but that's okay. I love spontaneity. I love, I mean, I'm okay with the date, but I like a spontaneous date too. You know, if me and my husband, we were dating, we, we had dates every Friday night because we weren't married. Right? So we had a date. We, had, we worked all week or went to school, but on Friday night at such and such time, he's picking me up and it was just set. We were, we were going steady. And then we got engaged. So we could just book it that every Friday night at a certain time, unless he was late up, getting off of work, he was going to show up at my house at a certain time. We were going to go out and eat. We were going to go to a movie. And then we ended up back at my house and he'd about fall asleep on the couch with me and Mama watched Johnny Carson. That was one of my days. I used to tell Mama, he's a pawpaw. What am I going to do with a pawpaw? He's like, 20-something years old, he's already a papa. My husband, my mama said, Angela, let me give you some wisdom. Once a player, always a player. Once a papa, always a papa. You'll never wonder where that man is. She said, you hang on to him. So <laughs> 9.30, that man's still asleep. Like at, at this day, at 9.30, he's falling asleep. Unless there's a, a football game or a baseball game or, you know. But other, he, he always came home from work. He was never late from work. And that was something amazing that my mother taught me was – Oh, 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 let's see. Oh. I'm trying to hit. Okay, can't do it. <laughs> okay, here we go. So Lisa, she says, Lisa and Carlin are watching with you. Um, I trip over my own words sometimes. I hear you, Jean. Uh, Josie Viola, hey, y'all. Are you all? Ira says, good evening. And Carlin says, I like spontaneous, too. Okay, I love this. Um, you know, God is just so faithful. So does anybody have a comment before we, we end for the night? Anybody want to say anything or share anything about what we talked about tonight? Sherry, you look like you had a really fun time. You got a beautiful smile going. You it's like a lot to take in, but it's also an answer to prayers. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see that smile. It means, it means a lot. You know, it's kind of hard to believe that we're so loved, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It is. It is really hard to believe we're no, so loved. No, it's true. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be here soon. Mm -hmm. You know, at moments it's here. Mm -hmm. You can go back into your imagination and remember a moment in time where you felt the love of the Father, the love of Jesus, the love of the Holy Spirit our self-acceptance. And if you meditate on that, just stay there for a little while. Do you know that your heart is where eternity is? The Bible says eternity is in the heart of a man. And so you can just go into your imagination, close your eyes, and just remember that. Jesus, when I had an encounter with him one time, he told me he calls that the room of remembrance. He said, Angela, don't you know that every time you suffer, I go into my room of remembrance and I remember where I suffered the same? I said, oh, my gosh. He said, you do the same thing. I said, I do. He said, yes. You have Me Too stories, don't you? Every time somebody tells a story of when they were rejected or betrayed or falsely accused or whatever, your brain automatically goes back to, yeah, I remember when that happened to me. He said, but the room of remembrance is the heart chamber. It's in my heart. He said, and I always wait for you here. And sometimes you show up and sometimes you don't. He said, but I will always be here even if you don't show up. I will go into the room of remembrance of your heart and mine at the same time because I dwell in you. And he said, every time you hurt, that's where I'm at. If you feel like God, our Father's not answering you, I'm in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
If you feel hungry and thirsty and you feel like God's not feeding you, then I go in the desert. If you feel betrayed, I go back to when Judas kissed me and when I dipped the bread in the bowl with him. When you feel ashamed, I go back in the city square where I'm naked and being beaten and spat on. He said, you do that. And, he, and literally, he told me, he said, I call it a room of remembrance. He said, it's where I make intercession. Yeah, so you can go there anytime you want to. You don't have to wait for a moment to come happen to you. You can go there. The Bible says the kingdom of God is in you. And he says, come. Just go into your heart. You, can, you do it all the time with fear. Yeah. Why not do it with love? Has anybody in here purchased the, uh, the workshop? It's not um, uh, the truth about believing. Has anybody, anybody you have, have you watched it yet? Yeah. First, it, first, first one. When you get to the end, the, the last two, um, you're trained through the whole thing of how to do this. And I'm showing you emotionally what's going on. But when you actually get to the meditation exercises, you can replay those and replay those and replay those. And I actually show you how to walk into your imagination and abide there for as long as you want to. And when you're in that imagination place and you feel the love of God, you actually are rewiring your brain and your body and your heart brain connection. And right now, we're, well, we come into the world wired in fear. And, but that's okay. God didn't make a mistake when he fearfully and wonderfully made you. He wasn't like, oh, oops, man, I was the wrong ingredient. No, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And so, but you mature from that into perfection. And perfection means um, perfect love. It means to know that you're loved and you don't just know it here, but you feel it. But you, you feel your feelings in your heart. You don't feel your feelings in your knowledge. So that, that Truth About Believing workshop is inexpensive. If you've been to my workshop, you should have gotten an invitation and you have a discount coupon. If you haven't been to the workshop, it's still inexpensive. It's $97 and you have like, I don't know, five hours. But then you can rewind that over and over and you could do the meditation work. And you could take any kind of meditation into that that you want to and reframe because it's based on Mark eleven twenty four. 24. You can actually feel loved. And the more you do that, the more it becomes spontaneous. Fear is spontaneous. You can walk in a room, you feel a feeling, and all of a sudden you feel you're afraid of being rejected. That's spontaneous. Well, that used to happen to me all the time. Like, when I say all the time, like most of the time. But now when I walk into a room, I don't ever feel rejected. Ever. Doesn't matter where I'm at. And if I feel the feeling of rejection in the room, I'll, I'll look around and wonder who feels rejected. Who is it that I'm feeling? <laughs> And I look for that person who's suffering in rejection, and I'll say, Father, where, what do you want me to do with this feeling? And I'll wait till the Father tells me. He might want me to give somebody a hug. He might not. He might say, just sit here and, or sit in the, I've had God tell me, sit in the back, in the back, cor back corner of the room. And then my pastor would see me sitting in the back corner of the room, and she'd say, Angela, come here. And then she'd pull me up, and exactly the person that whatever, where I need to be is where she'd tell me to come stand or be. But I used to think that that feeling of rejection that I could feel in the room belonged to me. But it was somebody rejecting me rather than it's like, you know, if you walk into a room and you smell a dead fish, do you assume it's you? <laughs> no, you don't assume the dead fish is you if you walk in the room. You will, man, I smell dead fish. I wonder where it's at. But if we walk in a room and we smell rejection, we assume it's us. We assume that somebody's not going to like us because why? Because you don't like it. You're afraid they're going to find the part of you that you don't like. Wow, yeah. So start liking all the parts of you that you don't like. And when you start loving you, you know what other people do? They flip and love you. I get more hugs when I walk into church. I literally make my rounds. People go, are you from here? 
all these things. I'm like, yeah, well, that's because I'm usually gone. And I come and go, come and go, come and go. But when I come, like sometimes there's a line of people hugging me. That's because we've, our hearts have been knit like this. We have suffered together. That's why they come hug me. They come hug me because I've, we've snotted all over each other. That's why they're hugging my neck. I've gone into their heart. They've gone into my heart. And we have just wept. You know, we just cried and cried, cried buckets together. So sharing, this is a lot to take in because love is omnipresent. There's a lot of love to take in. And most of us have a lot of void that needs to be filled with love because we think we're lacking. And just like he told his children, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were lacking? Who told you I didn't make you covered? Yeah. Who told you I wasn't enough? Who told you that you weren't enough? Right? You guys, you're made in the image of God. That was the message this morning at our church, and I just love that message. It was absolutely just so simple, so pure, so beautiful. And the man that came, uh, I shared it earlier, I did a watch party. His name was uh, John Tussey, and he, um, he's been gifted with uh, a, a quantum physicist gave him the frequencies of all the elements of the earth and oxygen and carbon and the frequency of DNA and he weaves it in his music and his music is absolutely amazing. You just feel like you could just be immersed in it. And um, that's why I shared it this morning. You guys can go watch on the gathering place and re-listen to some of it. It's just so beautiful. Just wanted to share it. But um, I want to say, I love you guys and thank y'all for joining me tonight. And I'll update you as to how we're going to be, um, doing the wild water. I'll, I'll talk with a couple of the women that um, it's going to be, um, I guess, taking Miss Christie's place. And we'll decide what we're going to do, and what we're not going to do. Um, but, you know, I've really felt like it was, it was that anyway, because this group is really not big enough to support the cost that's associated with it. You know, I mean, it gets pretty expensive to do what I do and I'm happy to do it, but there's, there's less expensive ways to do it. You know, we were doing it that way because there was a lot of people asking but sometimes when people ask, they ask and they think they want it and that's okay. And then they decide they don't. And you know what? No hard feelings. I learned a lot. Um, you know, but there, is a, there, are, there are other ways we can still meet and it not be associated with, um, you know, having it edited and having it posted here and doing this and all the email stuff that was associated with the way that we've been doing this. But we're just going to revamp. And once we revamp, I'll let you know what it looks like at that point. And uh, just glad y'all are here. And I love y'all so much. Gina, I love yes. you. Cheryl, I love you. And uh, everybody on Facebook, I can't see y'all, but I love you too. So um, I will talk to y'all soon. Y'all can share this with people. Mm, I love you. Y'all can share this, um, and it, you know, it'll go on YouTube tomorrow. So just tag people and share it on your Facebook or do a watch party or something. Do something fun with it. All right, good night. Thank you.